Wonderful. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited about this talk because for me, it's um, perhaps my favorite kind of topic. You know, I have written a book on digestive health, but I, I am really interested and passionate about mental health. And the really what we're going to do with this particular theme is explore how personalized nutrition can improve adaptation to stress. And the benefit of understanding that mechanism and some of the interventions that we can use is that by pr improving adaptation to stress, we can really help mitigate some of the most common symptoms that people experience under chronic stress, including depression, anxiety, uh, loss of sleep and insomnia and um, related conditions. So it's a bit of a back to basics in some ways. What I'm going to do is take you through the research. As Denise rightly said, we're just going to focus on largely clinical trials, look at what works, um, how to apply it, and get some really good clinical take-homes. So the structure of what we're going to do is we'll dive into stress first, and we'll paint a picture of what it is, define it clearly, and we'll talk about the HPA axis, how that mediates primarily the stress response, and we'll also talk about the brain itself, because perhaps more than anything, it's the brain that is central to mediation of the stress response. So we'll, we'll look at those things. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, what I want to point out is just as was previously mentioned, there's a few affiliations and disclosures and things there. Um, they've been covered. So let's get straight into it. So what is stress? Well, the problem with talking about stress is that the term itself or the word no. stress is, um, is very ambiguous. So it's, you know, what does it actually mean? Uh, how do we define it? What we're going to talk about instead of stress per se, is we're going to use that naming system for talking about stress because it gives us a more accurate picture of what it is. And it also helps us understand what stress is physiologically a bit better as well. So we'll talk about allostasis and allostatic load. Very simple concepts, but I want to just define those before we get moving because they set the course for where we're going. So really... Um, very simply, what we're talking about in terms of allostasis is being stressed, so acute uh, experience of stress, whereas allostatic load is, is like chronically stressed out. That's um, essentially what the difference is between allostasis and allostatic load. So let's go a bit deeper into what those terms uh, actually mean. What allostasis means is quite literally achieving stability through change. So it's achieving stability through change. So simply, um, when you know, to put that in context, when we experience stress, our body responds, and it responds largely through the release of chemical mediators that are components of the stress response. These include cortisol, which we all know, sympathetic and parasympathetic hormones, floods of different neurotransmitters, but also cytokines and other metabolic hormones, uh, including insulin, for example. So it's a pretty dynamic concert of physiological response that helps us adapt to stress. And this stability through change is dynamic. So it's this hormonal neurotransmitter cytokine type response that helps us adapt to the stressor and restore uh, stability. So dynamic stability through change. So that's allostasis, and you can see immediately how that applies to like acute stress. You know, we have a release of these mediators that helps restore balance, and um, and hopefully the stress resolves, and you know we we uh, restore health. The thing is, no one re ever really experiences that. Typically, what we're dealing with is chronic stress, and that's allostatic load. So it's this same response, but it's elevated and um, sustained over longer periods of time. So that's allostatic load. It's these same chemical mediators involved in the acute stress response are uh, chronically elevated. Um, but this can occur in different patterns, in fact. So it's not just, oh, well, everything's elevated. It can occur through about five different sort of scenarios, so, or four different scenarios. We've got them listed here. So firstly, A, is that 
we can get repeated hits from multiple stressors. So it's like this, we're constantly fluctuating and elevating these uh, mediators of the stress response in response to acute hits of stress, so to speak. We'll look at this in an image in just a second, but I'm just painting the picture. And the second scenario is a lack of adaptation or habituation to the, to the actual response. So this is where we fail to recover uh, from these uh, hits of stress. The third scenario is prolonged response due to delayed shutdown. And then finally, we have an inadequate response that leads to compensatory hyperactivity of other mediators as well. So let's look at this uh, in the next image. So here you can see at the top, we have a normal stress response. You know, So we have um, the blue line here is indicating these physiological mediators of the stress response or the physiological response. Across the bottom here, we have time. And um, initially what we're starting with in the left sort of corner, so to speak, is stress, right? It's indicated there and this activates these mediators, they become elevated and then they decline as we have normal recovery from the stressful event over time. Well, what can happen, as I mentioned, is there are four sort of probable scenarios of what people are experiencing. Firstly, they have repeated hits. So it's just constant flood of these chemical mediators of the stress response over time just to, due to constant stress. Um, the second scenario is lack of adaptation. So there's this constant uh, lack of recovery as we're exposed to stress. There's also the third or C there, which is prolonged response. So we have this elevated physiological response with no time for recovery. And then finally, we can also see in some cases an inadequate response to the actual stress itself. So a hypo functioning of the stress response, which in makes us enable to adapt to the stressor as well. Um, so we, this is often analogous to what we call burnout. So we know uh, for sure that stress is linked to disease. It has a very strong association with the development of uh, various symptoms. And um, the problem with this is that the symptoms can be a bit ambiguous and difficult to define because stress is literally associated with everything. So if you look here, acute stress uh, is known to play a contributory role to things like allergic type uh, exacerbations, asthma, eczema, urticaria. We also know it contributes to vasomotor symptoms like migraines, hypertensive and hypertensive attacks, as well as various types of pain it can amplify. We also know it can acutely and chronically affect the gastrointestinal tract, acutely exacerbating pain, causing indigestion, diarrhea, constipation. And of course, stress can be psychological as well and result in symptoms such as panic attacks and psychotic episodes. Uh, chronic stress, we know, contributes to the development of a very wide range of chronic metabolic disorders, not only neuropsychiatric disorders like anxiety, depression, and cognitive dysfunction, but also sleep disorders, uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, and many, many others. So uh, this is why we're talking about it is because stress is a major underlying factor that's contributing to people's symptoms in a lot of cases. It's not the only cause, but it's a major contributory factor. Now, I know a lot of people are familiar with this, but let's review the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So the HPA axis is um, made up of the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. It's really just a concert of reactions that occur with chemical mediators across different organs, these, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals in response to stress. And the reason it's worth reviewing is because this really is the central mediating system of the stress response. And the way I think about it is like this, is that stress starts in the ether, like it's not even a thing, stress. It's, uh, it's not even a physiological, chemical thing when it starts. It's really out in our external environment. It's really this combination of perception and environmental stimulus that then starts to make this stress response physical. And that starts in our brain. So it's chemical mediators that start to activate in our brain in response to our perception and our environment that make stress
physiological. And these chemical mediators then start to act on primary centers of the brain, like the hypothalamus, which then releases corticotrophin releasing factor, which then travels to the pituitary and the pituitary then releases adrenocorticotrophin releasing hormone. And then that floods from our brain through our systemic circulation and binds to receptors on the anterior lobes of the adrenal cortex, which then triggers the release of cortisol. This is all happening over uh, 40 minutes or so. And then the cortisol is released into our systemic circulation and it eventually floods back up through circulation into the brain, binding to receptors on the hypothalamus and pituitary and shutting down the system. It's beautiful, isn't it? So you have this chemical response in the brain activating a systemic stress response, which ultimately results in negative feedback and shuts the system down. So we respond, we adapt, and then we calm off the stress response. Of course, there's more acute manifestations of stress physiologically. The sympathetic nervous system can become activated on a hair trigger. So that happens very, very quickly. But this is the longer term stress response. And it's a beautiful system. It has this negative feedback, it's sort of shut off. It helps us adapt to stress. And stress is very positive. It's not a negative thing. But the reason it often becomes negative is because this whole system is over and chronically activated, as we've just seen. So what we're talking about there is not HP axis function. We're talking about dysfunction. And this typically results uh, physiologically in the development of two characteristic types of um, pathophysiological stress. And these are generally referred to in the literature as HP axis hyporesponsiveness or hyperresponsiveness. Um, what that means for us clinically is quite simple: is that some people are hyperreacting to stress, and other people physiologically are hypofunctioning under stress. So it's really that that simple. We can measure this uh, clinically with adrenal function testing. Uh, both waking cortisol is very useful for, in particular, for identifying this hyperreactivity and hyporeactivity because it's measuring a, a very dynamic um, aspect of the HBA axis. And you can also measure diurnal cortisol throughout the uh, day as well, over f typically four time points. And that'll give you at least a snapshot indicator of what their HBA axis is doing on a given day. So it uh, can be um, identifiable um, to some degree with functional testing, and you can break people almost into these different sort of subtypes of stress. So these subtypes have been really well studied, and um, one of the best reviews even today, it's a few years old now, is by George Krusos, one of the pioneers of research into the um, stress response. So I've referenced it here. It's in Nature Reviews and Endocrinology in 2009, definitely one of the most seminal works that have been done on stress. And I've um, simplified it in that I've um, condensed some of the symptoms and I've also added in strategies. And I've also changed the terminology a little bit. Instead of HV axis hyperactivity, I just called it strung out because I find that a really useful way to conceptualize it clinically. And instead of HVA axis hypo activity just burnt out i mean these are not scientific terms but they help us contextualize what is going on in these different stress responses and in hp axis hyperactivity we know that this is um, type of physiological response is strongly associated with anxiety disorders insomnia melancholic depression you can see the list here obsessive compulsive disorders panic addiction central obesity and hyperthyroidism um, also um, on the flip side of that, we have the burnout or HPA axis hypoactivity, and this is associated with what we sort of think of as being adrenal burnout, but is um, better defined as hyperfunction of the HP axis. Adrenal burnout is more of a popular term than, than one that's perhaps scientific. We have um, hypersomnia, atypical and seasonal depression, chronic fatigue syndrome typically falls into this category as well as fibromyalgia, PTSD, and hyperthyroidism. So when you, the usefulness of understanding all of this is that if someone has a particular 
type of physiological dysfunction, they're going to respond to a particular type of physiological intervention or focus. And very simply, if someone is in the sort of strung out HPA hyperfunction category, what we need to be thinking about, I feel, is calming down the brain and the nervous system. So really focusing on reducing this hyperactivity and hyperresponsiveness of the uh, the central nervous system and HPA axis. And then on the flip side of that, if someone's hypofunctioning, it's really, well, how do we restore their adrenal adaptation to, to stress and help bring back this healthy cortisol rhythm and, and improve um, adaptation? So food for thought, and we'll come back to um, what that means uh, clinically in terms of um, uh, interventions in a moment. But carrying on the physiology, I want to touch very briefly on the brain. And the reason this is really important is because the brain is the central mediator of the stress response. And under chronic stress, our brain undergoes functional and structural changes. What is happening is, is that the brain becomes, um, it actually be, loses mass in areas of the brain that are involved in memory, concentration, um, and, um, and contextualizing stress itself. So the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are very well known to decline in size under chronic stress. The brain is actually being destroyed, and this is measurable. The other thing that's happening is certain areas of the brain, particularly the amygdala, which is involved in the fear response, increase in size. So we, the nerves become destroyed and atrophied, in the areas of our brain that are involved in memory and, and conscious thought, and the areas of our brain that are involved in rapid primal response to stress actually increase in size. So our whole brain structure and function is changing. That's the bad news. The good news is that we can alter that. So nutritional and lifestyle medicine has been very clearly shown to increase the health of the brain, improving the size, literally, I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but it's science fact of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and actually reducing that hyperactivity of the amygdala. So a lot of the interventions we're using, and I'll touch on examples, can actually improve brain structure and function. So here you can see the cycle I'm talking about is we have a loss of the brain's regulation of stress. We have you know, chronic stress and low resilience resulting in HPA axis hyperactivation. We get increased stress mediators. These mediators, in particular, cortisol, result in atrophy of the nerves in the areas of the brain. So that results in the brain structure and function. We get loss of the brain's regulation of stress because it's the brain that helps contextualize and helps us to de deal with stress effectively. And this cycle sort of perpetuates and, and uh, declines over time. The good news is we can intervene and do something about it. And, and that's what we're really here to talk about. And um, one of the sort of key people that have worked in this area over the years is Bruce McEwen and uh, Sonia Lupin from Rockefeller University. And what they've been able to show quite clearly is that a healthy mind equals healthy body. And the more we can alter lifestyle and diet to improve the brain's function and structure, the more we can improve adaptation to stress and result in and sort of uh, healing of this malfunction of the stress response. So the way I think of it is like this, is what we're doing is we're opening, by helping reduce this negative metabolic effect of stress, we're opening a window of opportunity to help the brain repair and restore and function and and improve clinical symptoms as a result. The great news is, is one of the best ways to do this is with nutrition, and that's what we're going to talk about now, is uh, how we can personalize just some simple nutritional interventions to reduce stress, improve HPA axis function, improve the regeneration of the brain, and help reduce clinical symptoms in, in certain scenarios. So I've really... Um, kept it quite simple. We've got here a sort of algorithm for identifying some of the key things that are particularly relevant for people who are suffering from chronic stress. You know, are they stressed? Do they have a poor diet? Are they consuming a lot of caffeine? Is that an issue even? Um, and then looking at some of the key nutritional factors. We know that B vitamins play a critical role. Magnesium is vital. 
vitamin C often sort of dismissed as too simple and overlooked, but huge impact on the stress response and the health of the brain. So still a very useful clinical intervention. Um, and of course, the omega-3 fatty acids play a, a really critical role in optimizing brain and uh, neurological health. And then sort of personalizing things even further, we can identify interventions that really help for these individual presentations of the stress response. So is someone strung out? Are they burnt out? Can they sleep well? There are things that we can use to personalize. There are listed a couple. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think these are particularly good examples of things that work. So let's talk about food first, because that's, you know, that's where it all starts. And you might be surprised to know that actually the first randomized controlled trial of diet for depression was only published in January last year. So this was called the SMILES trial. It was headed up by uh, Felice Jacker and colleagues um, in, uh, in Australia, actually, and they're, they're at Deakin University out there. Um, and quite remarkable that this had never actually been done before, you know, given that all we talk about with food and mood and, you know, food for um, mental health. But a remarkable study, um, not only because it was the first, but because of the results. So what they did here is they constructed a sort of diet for depression and um, the theory behind the diet's also been published but i can summarize it for you it's very simple they took the model of the traditional mediterranean style diet and they tweaked it slightly uh, for depression basically and um, using this intervention and they then took uh, two arms of the clinical trial one through the dietary intervention and counseling and the other through a control which was actually just cooking classes that weren't particularly healthy and they wanted to control for the social interaction of the nutritionists that were counseling them as well as the group sessions as well so that was the purpose of um, the control arm is to control for the social aspect of the influence because we know that can improve mood. So head to head, the anti-depression diet um, resulted in basically a remission rate of 32%. So after 12 weeks, one in three people were no longer clinically depressed. Now this, you can't really understate how big an impact that is. If you look at randomized controlled trials on drug therapy, for example, like classic antidepressant drugs, it's a good drug if 50% of people respond with a sort of 50% improvement. That's considered a, a pretty good drug. Here we're seeing one in three people going into remission, which is remarkable. Um, so a big effect of diet. This is, since this study was published in January, this seminal paper, another uh, randomized controlled trial of diet in depression has been published. And they found very similar effect of the dietary intervention in terms of uh, response rate and, and clinical effect. So the good news is with this kind of research is we can say, well, diet works. Uh, dietary counseling and towards a healthier dietary pattern, teaching people how to cook and eat well can have a dramatic impact on depression, in some cases sending people into remission within just 12 weeks. Quite remarkable. Beyond our dietary interventions, there are a number of different foods that have been clinically studied as, um, uh, and their effects on mood. I've just listed the key ones I was able to identify with the literature search here. It's probably no surprise, but green leafy vegetables, perhaps the most important brain food per se, um, have been shown to improve mood, reduce anxiety, reduce stress, improve overall physical health. So green leafy vegetables, the top of the list. Um, and then high polyphenol foods like pomegranate, walnut, and blueberries, and cherries, for example, have all been shown to improve mood in clinical studies. And interesting flaxseed as well has been shown to buffer cortisol response and, and um, improve the stress response as well. So that could be a, an interesting sort of useful intervention if it fits. So there are the references. A question that I'm frequently asked as a, a teaching nutrition is, you know, what do I think of coffee? And and um, one of the problems I find with um, overgeneralization of the effects of coffee on the stress response is that it's often not really based on fact. It's based on what might appear to be fact, but is more a scientific myth. And one of the problems 
with understanding the science on coffee and the stress responses that we often use studies on pure caffeine and then generalize that to coffee. But coffee is not caffeine. Coffee is a complex, phytonutrient-dense, mineral-rich beverage um, that isn't just made solely of caffeine. Now, it's really interesting when you dive into the literature, clinical studies on caffeine purified have generally found, um, at least in some studies, that it does indeed activate sympathetic nervous system activity, will increase cortisol in some, but not all studies. When you look at caffeinated coffee, there's only a couple of studies there, uh, but typically what they've found is that coffee prevents the morning cortisol concentrations from falling rather than increasing its activity. And um, also um, in one study, it was found to increase sympathetic activity without a concomitant cortisol increase. So it seems at least that for some people, coffee is more of improving their adaptation to stress than disrupting it and aggravating things. Of course, everyone's different and genetically different people respond differently to coffee. Uh, people can be hypersensitive to caffeine, of course, and that can increase feelings of anxiety. But generally speaking, if people are not sensitive, they don't have a particular uh, genotype, especially the adenosine uh, gene polymorphisms, uh, coffee is not a, a major thing on the list in terms of aggravating stress chronically in the, in the long term, to my mind. So in addition to addressing diet and controlling for coffee intake um, for certain individuals, we need to also uh, look at the role of B vitamins in um, managing the stress response. And it's pretty clear that um, consistently B vitamin therapies is, is a low cost, big bang for your buck way to improve adaptation to stress and improve mood. This is a meta-analysis of eight clinical studies of multivitamin and mineral supplements, um, finding generally, especially those with high B vitamins, were able to improve the stress response, mood, psychiatric symptoms, and feelings of stress within 30 days. So really effective uh, approach, and often, I think, sort of overlooked in favor of newer, more complex uh, interventions, the good old B complex. Um, the important thing, of course, is that dose matters. This brilliant review by David Kennedy um, at Northumbria University, just published in 2016, open access paper is like the best review on B vitamins you'll come across. And what he points out is quite consistently across the literature, you really need a, a big dose of B vitamins to improve the stress response far beyond the NRV or RDA or, or whatever you want to call it. But it's really using these higher potency B complexes to improve our psychiatric health is, is critical. And one of the rationales for that, of course, is that just some people need more B vitamins and it uh, sort of overrides genetic um, predisposing factors that uh, influence response to B vitamins. So it, hitting people with a big dose, especially in the initial phases, phases of uh, treatment can be really useful. And one of the best products we have for that is the B Complex Plus, um, which is pictured here. It's a great dose of all the core B vitamins, including the active forms of uh, B2 and B3 and, and uh, B6, as well as uh, good doses of active methylfolate and B12. So a really simple, you know, good value intervention. One capsule a day gives a, gives a good dose of these sort of core B vitamins. It's a great comprehensive formula, once daily capsule, active forms, including methylfolate. So wonderful product for supporting the stress response and optimizing B vitamin intake. So another nutrient that's really important to be mindful of when we're dealing with chronic stress is magnesium. And we know that magnesium deficiency is much more prevalent in people with psychiatric disorders, particularly anxiety and depression, um, and quite likely uh, cognitive decline as well. But Maybe that's another story. So very commonly deficient, more so than the general population in people with psychiatric presentations. And, um, you know, even if you look at the general population, sort of intakes are really chronically low. Um, the great news is over the last few years, there have been some really wonderful, high quality clinical trials proving the stuff works. I mean, we've known this for, you know, well for clinically for years is that magnesium is just 
can be incredible for some people, especially if they're chronically deficient. Um, but there have been a few studies like this where we're looking at just daily supplementation, typically around uh, at least 250 milligrams of elemental magnesium. In this particular report, over six weeks in patients with depression, randomized controlled trial, and they found uh, very robust clinical improvement, and the improvement was quite noticeable within just two weeks. Uh, so really useful intervention. We know that um, some of the ways in which magnesium is working, it's involved in you know, various aspects of neurotransmitter function and brain health, but importantly also, it's been shown uh, in humans to decrease cortisol um, elevations as well. So it may be helping regulate that stress response, modifying cortisol output, and, and that's part of the reason why it's helping improve mood. Um, so really my preferred form of magnesium for the stress response is magnesium glycinate in particular. And um, part of the reason for that is that when we're looking at magnesium, you know, for me, the key thing that helps me decide which type of magnesium to use is really the, um, you know, the anion or the uh, molecule that it's chelated to. Um, because these have functional properties, right? And there's often a fairly high amount of these. So I think from memory and two capsules of magnesium glycinate, you're probably looking at a few grams almost of um, pure glycine. And the wonderful thing about glycine is, is that there's a receptor for it in the brain and it has um, anti-stress type effects um, and has been in fact shown to uh, it help improve sleep with a non-drowsy effect, for example. So really useful amino acid uh, complex to the magnesium. Um, so, so magnesium glycinate's a wonderful um, sort of choice for the stress response. Um, the pure formula is just pure mag glycinate in a capsule, 240 milligrams per two caps. And really with magnesium, my sort of dosage recommendations is minimum two twice daily. As, uh, as a starting point. Um, so there you go. Um, so very well tolerated, bioavailable magnesium glycinate, 240 milligrams per two caps, and uh, just great for correcting low magnesium levels. Uh, so common problem in presentation. So I've got here um, a differential, because you know a lot of people like using magnesium citrate as well. It's very common and popular formula. And I've listed here some of the key things for me at least that differentiate the two and these are all you know based on the literature is you know we know magnesium glycinate particularly for the glycine could be useful for stress and sleep and little known factors that glycine also boosts glutathione which is an interesting side point if that's a benefit to your particular patient maybe based on genotype clinical presentation or blood glutathione levels we also know magnesium citrate because of the citric acid has some unique features. The citric acid is a, a Krebs cycle intermediate, so it's involved in mitochondrial respiration and energy production. Citric acid alone, like just by itself, has been shown to improve fatigue and elevate uh, energy. And magnesium as magnesium citrate has been shown to um, improve fatigue in patients with fibromyalgia. So it's a nice fit for people with low energy and fatigue, I feel. So moving on from uh, low magnesium status and improving that is another thing we need to consider is is vitamin C deficiency. You know, of course, scurvy is rare, um, but suboptimal uh, blood levels or, or plasma levels of vitamin C aren't uncommon. And um, here you can see that in the general population, about 10% of adults are actually suboptimal for vitamin C based on plasma. Um, so, so this is worth considering is that one in 10 people could be essentially vitamin C deficient and that prevalence becomes much higher in people uh, that are smokers, for example, have low socioeconomic status and also in psychiatric disorders as well. So you'll find a higher prevalence in people with depression and, and related symptoms. So particularly relevant. And, uh, you know, it's been known for years, this is sort of one of the core treatments for psychiatric disorders in orthomolecular medicine is that, and part of the reason is it was spotted early on by um, investigators such as John Smithies is that the brain is uh, hungry for a score bait. It's um, where most of the vitamin C is concentrated in the human body and it plays critical roles in maintaining brain structure.
structure and function and health. Uh, interestingly, the sort of second highest concentration is in our adrenals. So you kind of see where vitamin C is working throughout our physiology. It's the brain and adrenals, particularly relevant to stress, of course. So recently I wrote up this article for a, a local um, sort of trade magazine. And what I did is I reviewed a lot of the uh, work clinically that's been done on vitamin C. And when you dive into human clinical trials on vitamin C for depression, anxiety, stress, work-related fatigue, uh, it's huge. There's a tremendous amount of work that's been done in this area. And uh, what we know from all these clinical trials is that it works. Um, typically, these people are low to begin with. When you give them something as simple as vitamin C, normally close to 500 milligrams morning and night um, is, the, is the dose that's been prescribed. It works and uh, people feel better. Their stress response improves. Depression becomes mitigated. Uh, fatigue reduces and even cortisol reactivity to stress and chronic cortisol levels can decline. So a really useful, simple intervention. Pure have some great options for vitamin C, including this, the buffered ascorbic acid, which is a blend of mineral ascorbates. I like this. It's just a, a nice sort of classic blend of buffered vitamin C. And typically what you would do is one to two capsules morning and night. So really simple, old school intervention for improving adaptation to stress and, and mood. So the summary of the formula is it's neutral pH, so useful in that regard. It's also got these accessory minerals in small amounts. It's um, uh, 480 milligram per cap and um, really useful uh, for, for improving the stress response. So moving on from vitamin C and um, considering that in tr the treatment of stress, we round this off, this sort of general nutritional considerations with omega-3. Now, one simple way to assess whether or not someone requires uh, um, supplementation or increased dietary intake of omega-3 is just to assess their omega-3 index. Very simple um, blood test that's even available with spot testing now, depending on what's available in your area, I guess. Um, but really useful way to get a barometer sort of feel for where people are sitting uh, individually because, you know, it's all about personalization. And um, what I've got here is I sort of pulled together some of the um, references that are, are known. Uh, typically, we associate with uh, an omega-3 index above eight as a very low risk of cardiovascular disease. And you know, risk for depression is less clearly defined, but I would say the same thing, is that if you're above eight, you're at very low risk. If you're above four, you're in sort of medium category, so you're really want to push that up higher and higher. And if you're below four, you're in trouble, basically. And you can see where people sit. You know, the UK average here where I am is pretty poor. They're generally in the medium category in the US. It's pretty atrocious. And then what you'll see in people who are presenting clinically with major depression, bipolar, and, um, and of course, cardiovascular disease is that they're very low. So there's a strong correlation between a low omega-3 index index and these uh, chronic clinical presentations. So, you know, what if you identify, you know, a need for increased omega-3, um, will it work? Well, regardless, if you indiscriminately supplement with omega-3 in people with depression, it tends to work. Um, and that's what's been shown in multiple studies here. We're looking at 19 trials in both depression, clinically defined and depressed, uh, but not major depression uh, patients. And uh, classically, it's been shown to result in significant benefit versus placebo. Uh, so really useful clinical intervention. We also know physiologically that one of the ways omega-3 fatty acids are working is they buffer the stress response. So if someone is presenting with uh, high diurnal cortisol, uh, just something as simple as omega-3 fatty acids can be really useful for reducing cortisol reactivity as well as basal levels over time, uh, which is what we're looking at here. This is after just three weeks um, and we're looking at cortisol response to stress and three weeks of supplementation with really just you know, 1.8 grams of omega-3. It's not that much. 
one of the great things about omega-3 as well is that it really is this sort of super nutrient for the brain. And we've known for many years that omega-3 deficiency uh, impairs neurological function since the 70s, roughly. Um, some of the work, primary, you know, pioneering work was done in this area around that time by Mo Michael Crawford and colleagues. And they also came up with the aquatic ape hypothesis to point out that, well, actually, omega-3 is essential for brain evolution function structure as well. And and that's what we're looking at here, in fact, is is the effect of blood omega-3 index. Um, so this is increasing in number across the bottom. And up the left-hand side is the volume of the hippocampus. So that's brain size. And you can see quite clearly is that our blood, as our blood levels of omega-3 go up, there's a very strong correlation with an increased brain size. Isn't that incredible? And it's been demonstrated, you know, not just through association as we're looking at here, is that if you take someone with a low hippocampal volume, like we're looking at in the left-hand corner here, and then give them omega-3, that hippocampal volume increases in size within a matter of months. It's quite remarkable. So the is a really strong effect of omega-3 on brain structure and function that helps us understand why it's improving mood and adaptation to stress. So how much omega-3 do we give is a great question and I don't think we fully have the answer, but a lot of, like a lot of nutrients, there seems to be a sweet spot. And uh, I think we're getting closer to defining what that is. And to my mind, it's, probably around the one to two gram mark as these authors are pointing out if you look at controlled dose response studies this is the kind of level that will elevate people up to around four percent it also correlates well with historical intakes uh, it's sort of pre-agricultural and pre-industrial intakes um, so you know if you want a starting point around one to two grams a day is is uh, really useful if someone's diet is very healthy and rich in omega-3. I personally drop that down to around 500, just as a maintenance. Um, but uh, for most people, one to two grams a day is a really good starting point to help elevate their blood omega-3, and it will do that consistently over time. So again, Pure have some great options uh, in this area, and one of my favorites is just the EPA DHA Essentials. It's a very simple formulation. It's a thousand milligram soft gel, uh, good size. It's not enormous, which is useful to know for patients, and um, so easy to swallow. And uh, unlike some fish oils, and it also um, provides 500 milligrams per cap, so a nice sort of measured amount. Um, very useful, just one a day as a maintenance for someone who's relatively healthy, but for people that really need supplementation to support stress response, uh, you really um, are looking at closer to two caps a day, getting up to a thousand total EPA DHA to even two caps morning and night if someone um, is, uh, you know, particularly low omega-3 index or has uh, clinical depression. So the key features are listed there. I, I mean, I don't need to run through purity with pure, but it's um, a very pure product. It's sort of squeaky clean in terms of fish oil. It's thoroughly tested like all pure products for heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, furans. All the oxidation and rancidity tests are done as well as microbial contaminants. And it's one of those fish oils that just blows standards out of the water, so it exceeds uh, purity and quality guidelines, um, benchmarks by the CRN, uh, EP, and USP as well. So it's sort of tops all of the sort of standard benchmarks in terms of quality, purity, and uh, environmental contaminants. So very clean, safe, non-oxidized, and uh, standardized dose. So... Moving uh, into a summary of just some of these basic recommendations, you know, beyond uh, dietary intervention, counseling, um, you know, foods for stress and, and caffeine and things, we then have just a quick checklist for, for supplements and uh, nutritional interventions here. I've listed a few that I haven't mentioned, like one multivitamin as a way to optimize B intake. Uh, it's a 
fantastic option. It is a lower dose uh, than the B complex, uh, so it may not be always the place you start. But I use one multivitamin a lot. It's a fantastic formulation. There's the magnesium glycinate, which for me stands out as the key form of magnesium for depression and um, and mood. Uh, so very useful. Um, ascorbic acid, just pure ascorbic acid is brilliant um, and a good way to get a, a nice dose of vitamin C. You can also use the buffered ascorbic acid, which I particularly like, and that's available as capsules and powder and some key recommendations there on why, why to use it, um, plasma levels for cutoff point and as well as um, suggested dosages. And then finally, the EPA and DHA SM cells. You can also use one Omega and um, very useful if there's a low dietary intake, uh, depressive symptoms, high cortisol or a low, low Omega-3 index, for example, just some of the indicators. And uh, like I said, really at least two capsules a day if someone's exhibiting symptoms of chronic stress. So then moving from these sort of core nutritional considerations, let's have a look at some of the things that we can do to personalize um, treatment for unique subtypes of uh, stress. And we'll start with this sort of strung out. So this is the picture we spoke about where people are hyper reactive to stress. And for me, really, one of the key things that's particularly useful for that clinical presentation is ashwagandha or Withania somniferia. And uh, or somnifera and um, ashwagandha is just amazing for for this. A lot of people will respond very well to it. It sort of seems to fit people generally quite well. And um, historically, of course, it's been used as an ad adaptogenic, rasayana, anti-stress, nervine tonic uh, for nervous exhaustion, insomnia, and memory dysfunction. And the cool thing is all these traditional uses have been verified in modern human clinical trials. So we know it works for all this stuff uh, scientifically as well. Like, look at this is just, you know, a, a recent, uh, relatively recent meta-analysis or, sorry, systematic review on ashwagandha for anxiety. I think it's arguably the best studied herb for anxiety um, in this review, which is a few years old now. There have been a few clinical trials published since, but they identified five human clinical trials and consistently it reduced symptoms of anxiety, stress, and in most cases, there's highly significant effects um, and, you know, uh, clinically meaningful, of course. Uh, since then, quite a few reports have been published. I'm not going into the anxiety studies, but this is a brilliant one on stress-related eating. And uh, what we're looking at here is a clinical study in people who were uh, eating, uh, overeating in response to stress. They were also overweight. After giving them ashwagandha for eight weeks, their feelings of stress went down. Their stress-related eating was reduced. They actually ate less. Their cortisol levels went down and they lost body weight as well. They lost close to a few kilos within the eight weeks um, simply because their stress response was improving and that attack attachment to eating in response to stress as a way of sort of self-medicating was also mitigated. So really useful for helping people adapt. And I love it as a bridge to lifestyle changes. It's a really fantastic uh, formula to get in there and get quick clinical results. So um, here again, we're looking at the effects of ashwagandha and this time on the physiological response of stress. This is an older study and um, looking at its uh, influence on a number of things. Um, but what I wanted to highlight was cortisol lowering so here in the graph, we're looking at the effects of ashwagandha over two months. We're looking at percent changes, um, which is the, the scale here. PSS is the perceived stress severity scale. The GHQ is the general health questionnaire. The DAS is a classic depression, anxiety, and stress severity scale. All of these are measuring basically things like anxiety, insomnia, social dysfunction, depression, and stress. Uh, all of these are dropping. So these are the clinical symptoms. But what's really interesting is the last one, and that's salivary cortisol. And that uh, was significantly decreased over the two months as well. So a really useful way not only to improve symptoms, which is you know, a pretty dramatic reduction, but it's also physiologically reducing uh, cortisol as well. So pure ashwagandha is just a 500 milligram cap, a big hit of ashwagandha. In my opinion, you only really need one of these a day. I give it in the morning, um, recommend it in the morning because it's 
I don't know, it just sort of fits for me um, to dose someone with a adaptogen in the morning, improve that stress response through the day. Um, you could also give it in the evening. You know, the name Somnifera comes from the Latin for sleep. Uh, it can be fantastic for helping knocking people out and helping them sleep. I mean, it's not a sedative, but um, for some people, it really does help them in the evening. So you could give it an hour before bed and, and see if that helps um, improve sleep at, at night. Amazing with melatonin, like the combination of these two are, are incredible. Um, the product features there, we've sort of covered it's um, 500 milligrams of ashwagandha and it's standardized to provide the uh, active withanolides. So then moving from ashwagandha, which really stands out for people who are strung out, uh, something for helping improve energy and adaptation to chronic stress is rhodiola. So a slightly different clinical presentation I find this fits quite well for. Um, rhodiola comes from a very different part of the planet. So ashwagandha, classic in Ayurvedic Indian medicine. Rhodiola comes from the north of Europe, as well as Russia and northern China. So it grows in the Arctic um, in particular, uh, hence its name Arctic Root. And it's been used in these traditional systems of medicine for relieving stress, fatigue, anxiety, and depression for, for many, many years. And like ashwagandha, there's been a lot of modern scientific interest and a lot of good clinical research on it. So if you look just at you know, stress-related fatigue, for example, this is a clinical study where people were dosed up on ashwag sorry, rhodiola who were experiencing stress-related fatigue and burnout. And uh, what they found was is that within 28 days, it improved mood, reduced fatigue, decreased cortisol and awakening. So that hyperreactivity to stress is dropping off. Uh, wonderful um, formula for that kind of thing. What I find clinically too is um, it's a good idea to give rhodiola at dose it in the morning and at lunch if you're doing it twice a day. Personally, I again, I just like to give it all in breakfast time. Um, but if you're going to space out the dose, give it at lunch instead of the evening because it can, for some people, be slightly stimulating in the evening. It's also been shown not only to help relieve fatigue but to reduce anxiety in a number of studies. This is just one where people were given 340 milligrams of extract a day. It reduced anxiety levels um, and the effects were actually comparable to anti-anxiety medications. Uh, that was within 10 weeks. There have been a couple of clinical trials looking at it for depression. It's been shown to reduce uh, and relieve mild to moderate depressive disorder. Um, here again, 340 milligrams a day within six weeks. So really widely useful, simple little intervention for helping people adapt to stress, particularly if they're burnt out, they need energy and need a sort of um, a bit of a kick basically to help restore that hypofunction of the HPA axis. One Side note on this is that rhodiola, thankfully, can work quite quickly as well. Um, you know, I've had people respond to it within a matter of days and, uh, and quite noticeably. So really useful, uh, simple intervention. So the um, pure rhodiola rosea is 100 milligram caps, which gives you a lot of flexibility on dosing. It's standardized to guarantee um, the uh, active phytonutrients and it's uh, a good dose as well, which um, is consistent with clinical research. So the, uh, yeah, that's the uh, formula there. Oops. Uh -huh. So then finally, what I want to touch on is uh, L-theanine. Now, L-theanine um, is an amino acid isolated from the tea plant. It was isolated by uh, the Japanese in the 1970s, around 79, I believe. And um, since then, there's been a lot of interest in L-theanine as a neuromodulator. And uh, the fascinating thing about this amino acid is that it's actually, um, it looks a lot structurally like GABA. So it looks like GABA aminobutyric acid, which is an inhibiting, inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So it's a kind of GABA analog. And uh, it does uh, influence the GABA receptors. It's also been shown consistently in humans to induce an alpha wave state in the brain, which is just cool, isn't it? Like, so you can give someone theanine and you change their brain waves. And uh, 
the relevance of alpha waves is that they're the kind of brain waves that produce when we're meditating or quite relaxed. So it's really helping induce uh, relaxation. Um, probably works through a whole host of different mechanisms, but these are some of the key ones, uh, gamma, GABA analog, so uh, inhibitory effect, as well as um, inducing alpha waves in the brain. Um, the cool thing too is it's non-drowsy and uh, can also help um, improve sleep. So it's been shown in a number of studies now to be a really useful intervention for helping people adapt to acute stress. Um, so there have been a few reports like this where you give students or people who are exposed to an acute stressor a single dose of theanine, then give them a stress test and they adapt better. They feel better and their stress response is um, reduced as well. So in this study, just 200 milligrams twice daily uh, for a few days actually reduced salivary alpha amylase, and, uh, which is a marker of sympathetic nervous system activity, and it also reduced subjective feelings of stress. There have been a few reports um, like this of L-theanine um, being a useful intervention for sleep uh, in men, in women, and in children with ADHD. It's been studied for this. And uh, typically, um, these sleep studies suggest that 200 milligrams an hour, uh, sorry, an hour before bed um, is very useful for improving sleep quality without, sed um, without sedation. And, uh, and it does it through anxiolysis, so you know, anti-anxiety type effects. Um, personally, I view insomnia as a barometer of HV axis dysfunction. It's not a nighttime problem. So what I'll frequently do when people exhibit with insomnia is don't give them something before bed, give them something in the morning as well, because their nervous system is on overdrive and the insomnia is just a symptom of that. So I would very rarely give theanine just before bed. I would give it in the morning as well. So dose people uh, twice a day um, to help um, reduce um, hyperreactivity of the nervous system, calm them down, help them feel better and help them sleep better. One thing to consider when you're looking at theanine is um, whether or not it's pure. So there's a lot of generic theanine out there, um, but as far as we know, only sun theanine contains pure L-theanine. The relevance of that, I mean, this is a independent study here analyzing products on the market, and really it was only sun theanine that was pure. A number of the others contained a D uh, isomer of um, theanine, and the relevance of that is the D form is not well absorbed. It inhibits L-theanine, and uh, it's probably less likely to be effective, basically, is the, is the take home. Um, so that's theanine, a really useful, simple clinical intervention. Typically, um, studies and the research indicates that 200 milligrams morning and night is, a, is an effective dose. You could cut that down to one capsule a day if you wanted to, uh, but typically 200 milligrams morning and night is um, what I would utilize. Um, and Pure's uh, L-theanine is sun theanine, it was the stuff that was isolated in the 70s, it's the stuff that all the clinical research has been done on, and it also guarantees you pure L-theanine uh, as well, so useful uh, to know. So here's a quick reference chart on some of the things we've just spoken about. So we have ashwagandha, very useful for high cortisol, anxiety type symptoms, and uh, really just one cap a day would be enough. Rhodiola, very useful for depression, stress, burnout, anxiety, and uh, in particular, pronounced fatigue. Um, so I would typically do two capsules twice a day, um, which is a sort of higher range dose. So you could just do two capsules in the morning. And then theanine, um, very useful for anxiety and insomnia, and really useful for just helping stabilize mood. Like it's for me, that's what theanine stands out for, is, is there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of insomnia, a lot of sort of instability. 200 milligrams morning and night can really help uh, improve things. Um, also quite safe to use alongside uh, psychotropic medications as well. Uh, if you're using it for sleep, just one capsule one hour before bed would be perfect. And that's that. So we've covered uh, quite a lot of ground running through how the stress response works, 
healthy brain fits into HPA axis dysfunction, its importance, how we can leverage personalized nutrition and diet to help uh, improve the stress response, ways in which we can personalize those uh, dietary and basic nutritional interventions, and then extended that into some of the things that we can use to help mitigate uh, acute and um, Oh, sorry, uh, more personal presentations of the clinical stress response like anxiety, depression, and fatigue using things like ashwagandha, rhodiola, and theanine for anxiety and insomnia. So what I'll do with all that in mind is, um, and this sort of whistle tops, whistle stop tour of stress is, is um, answer a couple of questions before we, we wrap up.